timing. So, uh, as Pastor Jason mentioned a couple of weeks ago, uh, the Lord brought us to this this topic of spiritual gifts, and, and I believe really He wants to do a work in this body, in this regard, and to open our hearts and minds into to deeper understanding into what God would have for us today. Um, it's a deep topic. There's lots of I don't want to say controversy. There's a lot of discussion. And, and differences of opinion and things on spiritual gifts. Uh, last time, really, we dealt with God's plan in the ov- his overall scope and what he desires to do with the gifts collectively. And that's really, if you remember, God doesn't just pour out the gifts so that he blesses us, although we truly are blessed by that. God's overall view of the gifts is that he pours out these gifts for the benefit of the body as a whole. We saw that last week, or two weeks ago, in Romans chapter 12. That was our base passage for that topic. Today, we're really going to deal in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. But before we do that, go there, and I'm going to give you a minute. I want you to open in two different places. So, Lord willing, later on, not today, but sometime down in the series further on, we're going to deal about something that's called the baptism of the Holy Spirit as well. And so in the advent of the church, when the church began, they were first told to wait. And so if you, if you have your other finger now that you've got your spot in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, turn to Acts chapter 1 as well. So before we dive all the way into this topic, I just want to talk to you very, very briefly about this idea or this topic of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So the writer of Acts is Luke, the same gospel writer, and he kind of begins the book of Acts about where he left off in the book of Luke, so they they tie together. So I'm just going to read a few verses at the beginning of Acts. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he has said, You have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It's not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So this passage brings up, quoting this passage, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And so they did wait. If you know the the story and the chronology of the book of Acts, they waited until the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And when the outpouring of the Holy Spirit came, there was great change. You saw Peter before the crucifixion. What happened as Jesus was in his trial and going through all of that? Did, was Peter a brave witness? In, in, in verse 8 it says, you know, you'll have power. You'll be witnesses for me. But what happened to Peter? He denied the Lord, right? Yeah, not just once, but three times. I, I can relate a lot to Peter. But when you see after the day of Pentecost... When you see after the baptism of the Holy Spirit, not that Peter was infallible, but the boldness of Peter went up to another level. Why was that? Because the Holy Spirit didn't come upon him. Because it was no longer just in his own strength. In his own strength, what did he do? He cut off the high high priest's servant's ear. That was the fleshly thing to do. But when the Holy Spirit came and they were baptized in the Holy Spirit, they had great power. The first sermon Peter gave was a pretty powerful sermon, and a lot of people came to know the Lord because the Holy Spirit was moving. The Holy Spirit was uh, pouring out not only his gifts, but himself upon the people. In the body of Christ, he desires to do the same thing today. 
Now, there are some theologians or some churches that believe, that we call them cessationalists, that the gifts were only for the first century or for the apostles' time. But there's really nothing in Scripture that would soundly back that up. God does have giftings for the whole body, and you'll see in the giftings that we go through in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, all of these things still exist. And it's for the benefit of the body because God still speaks. How many of you believe God speaks? Okay, amen. He, he speaks directly to us through his word, but there's times he wants to give even very personal uh, messages, if you will, he, because God knows us intimately. He knows our peaks. He knows our valleys. He knows when we're hurting. He knows when we need that touch. And sometimes when we won't even admit it, God will impress upon somebody else because he's all-knowing, and through the gifts operated, we're strengthened. And so now, if you would, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The church in Corinth was, in the Bible, probably the most gifted, if you will, churches that we read about, because Paul tells us in in chapter 1 of that, that they weren't lacking in any gift. They had all of the gifts. But they had some misunderstandings about the gifts. As a matter of fact, you can kind of read between the lines in that they thought because they had all of these great spiritual gifts that made them better than somebody else. That meant that they were spiritually mature. But that's not true. You can have all the spiritual gifts, but that doesn't make you necessarily spiritually mature. We see in chapter 14, and we might touch on that at some future time, they were abusing the gifts. At the end of chapter 12, you know, you can read down after today, you know, maybe go home and read through the passage again. You'll see that God gives greater honor to those that have some, some seemingly lesser gifts because people would take advantage of that, and they did. They thought because they had especially the gift of tongues, and this body was abused. And they thought, well, since I have the gift of tongues, then you know, that makes me important. It makes me the best. God says, no, it doesn't. It's all meant to work together to glorify him and strengthen the body. Okay, so in in chapter 12 in 1 Corinthians, let's just read the the beginning part of it, and we really won't get down to the gifts until about verse 8. But he says, now concerning gifts or spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. This is actually one of only four times that Paul says a phrase like that. I don't want you to be ignorant. It's important if he throws a phrase out that, it must be important for us to understand what God has for us in this realm. The very fact that he's bringing it up this way kind of means that somebody had asked him a question, too. He says, now concerning. Evidently, people had corresponded with Paul and asked questions. He wasn't directly there. He's going through people back and forth. And so this is something that had come up, and there were questions regarding this. He says in verse 2, you know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that somebody in the street can't say, Jesus is Lord. That's, that's not what Paul's talking about. But there were apparently already some errors and some heresies creeping into the church, early first century. This one is mostly docetism which is an early form kind of of Gnosticism, but basically the first heresies didn't have to do with denying Jesus' deity. It had to do with denying Jesus' humanity. And so that was apparently already going around. And so this idea probably comes from that there would be somebody saying, hey, you know, God is saying Jesus in his physical body, something, something to lower that or to degrade that Jesus couldn't possibly come in a physical body. But I want to ask you something just in that controversy or that heresy, if you will. If Jesus didn't come in a physical body and didn't have a physical body, could we have salvation? It's equally as important that Jesus physically came and that Jesus is God, because if one of those two is missing, we have no salvation. Because if Jesus isn't God, in the power of God, his sacrifice didn't pay for a thing. He just was a man that died on a cross like so many thousands of others in Rome. But if Jesus was not man, and somehow he was, you know, in whatever thinking they had, that when he died on the cross, that wasn't 
his blood shed for us, then we also would have no forgiveness, would we? Because without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. And so that heresy apparently was already going around. And, and so Paul sets them straight. He says, look, nobody can say that Jesus is Lord except that's from the Lord, from God himself, from the Spirit. At the same hand, nobody's going to say Jesus is a curse. That's not from God. That message certainly is not from God because Jesus is God's chosen vessel. He is God, and he shed his blood for us. And so then he, he gets into the meat of what he's talking about, into the gifts. He says, now there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but is the same God who works all and in all. But the manifestation of the spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. That was pretty much the topic of part one, is that God distributes individually at least one, likely multitudes of gifts. Every one of you has different giftings. I have different giftings than Pastor Jason. Kevin has different giftings than John. And that, praise God, isn't that, isn't that a wonderful thing? Because we need that diversity, we need that unity, but we need the Holy Spirit. You know, the last song that we sang, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. I pray that's true because the Holy Spirit's our teacher. Jesus said, hey, the Holy Spirit is our teacher. We need the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, our lives would be very dry. You know, churches typically throughout history, there's like a pendulum swinging. Sometimes it, it can become just so, and, and don't get me wrong, the Word of God is very, very important. But just the Word of God alone, no, no emphasis on the Holy Spirit and God wanting to speak directly to us, or, you know, that can get a little bit dry, or on the other hand, maybe what some might consider a Pentecostal background where it's very, very emotional, messages are kind of apart from the Word of God, and they can be very exciting, but not necessarily well-grounded. And there needs to be both because the holy spirit does still speak today and he desires to do a move in this place and draw us closer to himself and to each other so in that process he gives diversities or manifestation of the spirit is given to each one notice in verse 7 for the profit of who for the profit of all there's really only one spiritual gifting in the listing that is what I would consider a, a, a permanent gift is that, that it's not as a need arises, and that's the gift of tongues. It's a prayer language that God gives. The rest of these, really, as the need arises and God pours out his spirit, because he wants to do a unique work, as there is a need for that. Okay, so then let's begin. I'm going to read through the list of giftings, and then we're going to go back and we're going to look at just three of them this morning. Okay? It says, for to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the Spirit, and to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things distributing to each one individually as he wills. Okay. So today I want to talk to you about the beginning of that list, but quite often when teachers are talking about these, we kind of group them together. So today we're going to talk about what are often called the revelation gifts, which is the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, and discerning of spirits. Okay. So First on this list in verse 8, he says, to, to one is the word of wisdom. Now, there's a lot of interesting discussion about exactly what is word of wisdom, what is word of knowledge. It's not extremely clear. Matter of fact, I looked up several different commentaries, probably more than I can remember, and several different Bible translations. And guess what? There's a big diversity in how which one is wisdom, which one is knowledge, exactly what does that have to mean. As, as a matter of fact, 
If you look up in a few different Bible translations, some of the other common translations, one of them says message of wisdom, or wise advice, or speak with wisdom. So on this first gifting, what is the word of wisdom? I believe personally there's two or maybe three aspects to this gifting. And some of it may be semantics, what we call it, as opposed to another gifting. And what we're going to do with each gifting is we're going to kind of look at some biblical examples of, okay, here's this gift in operation. So the first aspect of the, about this gift is that it has to do with speech, uh, speaking forth or teaching doctrinal truths with special insight and application that God has for the occasion. Okay, so it's a special empowering. It's often in tandem with teaching. Uh, it has to do with wisely handling the Word of God, that first aspect. There are people in the Bible that, are known for this kind of a characteristic. There's three I can mention to you in the Old Testament, right off the bat, that kind of are known for this. One of them is Joseph. You know, God chose Joseph to preserve the nation of Israel. He was right next to Pharaoh as far as authority, and Pharaoh left everything into his hand. Another one was a king of Israel who was known for his wisdom. Who was that? Solomon, he was world-renowned for the wisdom. It wasn't just his own wisdom. He prayed for wisdom, didn't he? I said, hey, you can have what you want. So I went, what would you like? Give me wisdom to lead my people. And God gave him wisdom. And we have famous stories. The two women that brought him a child said, it's mine. No, it's mine. Okay, cut it in half. Well, that's not just man's wisdom, is it? That was special wisdom from the Lord. Another one that's very well known that we went through his book not too long ago is Daniel. Daniel was wiser than the rest in the, in the captivity. He was there serving the kings of Babylon and Persia, and God used him as well to preserve the nation of Israel, to preserve his word, and even to speak to the kings. He had that kind of a wisdom. In the New Testament... We have a lot of examples of Jesus, obviously. Jesus is a personification of all of these gifts, really. So we'll probably talk about some of the examples in Jesus' life in these giftings. So, Jesus and the Sermon on the Mount. One of the aspects of that about this gift is it's the Holy Spirit interpreting what the Holy Spirit has said. Because the Holy Spirit is the best commentator on the Bible. But in this gifting, God really speaks to that person that's going to bring it forth, and uh, that clear understanding is there. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, you've heard it said, right, a couple of different times. He said, you've heard it said that you shall not commit murder. Well, that's true. You shouldn't commit murder. Where does that come from? Ten Commandments, right? That was the common understanding. You shouldn't commit murder, but Jesus took it another level, didn't he? He says, but... If you're angry with your brother without cause, you're in danger. He also said, it's said that you should not commit adultery. That's a pretty common understanding, right? You should not commit adultery. But Jesus brought that to another level, didn't he? He says, yes, that's true, but I say if you look upon another woman with lust, you're guilty. You're guilty because the sin really begins in the heart, doesn't it? So Jesus was exercising this gift, if you will, A word of wisdom. Somebody uh, that we really don't read a lot about that I believe in the New Testament that also had this gifting is somebody named Apollos. It says in Acts chapter 18 that there was a certain Jew named Apollos. He was an eloquent man and mighty in scriptures. For he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. This is one of those giftings that I believe apologists typically have. You know, that they're able to refute. There's a very clear understanding God has instilled with them the supernatural amount of wisdom to go beyond doubt, to go beyond reasoning, to really solidify what is the central truth that we're talking about here. And Apollos had that kind of a gift. In this gift, if you will, the Spirit reveals mis- things that we would call mysteries, or in that time they'd call mysteries, things that were previously unknown or not understood. They would bring to clear light so that there is that understanding. A second aspect of this gift is what I would call giving the perfect answer. 
Okay, when there's a situation that is a compelling situation, a difficult, maybe an impossible situation, but God gives the perfect answer. Again, where do we find that kind of thing practiced? Jesus is the perfect place to go. The Pharisees tried to trap him several times. One of them was, tell us, Jesus, is it lawful to pay taxes or not? Ooh, if I say yes, then what will the Jews do? Because they didn't like paying taxes. They didn't even like you know, the picture of Caesar on the coin. If I say no, then it's Rome. It's in Roman territory, and that's rebellion. So if I say yes, I'm stuck. If I say no, I'm stuck. What do I do? Here's where the gift of the word of wisdom came in. What was Jesus' answer? Show me a coin. Show me a coin. Whose picture's on the coin? It's Caesar's picture, right? So render to Caesar what's Caesar's and to God's what's God's. It's a perfect answer. What could the Pharisees say about that? No. <laughs> no. <sighs> There's another, another few that happened kind of like that. Yeah, where, where Jesus was there, Jesus was brought a woman caught in adultery. Right? They wanted to see what he would do. If he says, stoner, well, that's not showing much compassion, and they, they felt like they had him. If he says, no, let her go, then he's not for the law. Again, one of those no-win situations, right? What did Jesus say? You who are without sin, hey, go ahead, cast the first stone. Yeah, be my guest. And little by little, there's probably more about it than we know because he wrote in the sand, too. I'd love to see what he wrote. <laughs> Where was the man? There was a lot of... But, you see, it was God's perfect answer for an impossible situation. It satisfied God's righteousness and God's mercy at the same time. And there is that kind of a perfect answer. Another question that they came to him, because they were so troubled. The religious leaders gave Jesus more of a difficult time than the heathen did, that's for sure. And he's, they came to Jesus and says, by what authority do you do these things? Uh, well, huh. Jesus knew their hearts and he understood. He says, well, I'll tell you what, before I answer you, you tell me, you, you answer me. Was the baptism of John from God or from men? Uh, let's see, if I say from God, then they're going to say, well, why didn't you answer? If they say, but I, I say he is from men, then they'll say, they knew he was a prophet. They recognized God, John was a prophet. In fact, Jesus calls John the greatest prophet of all, you know, of all time, if you will. So they were stuck because Jesus exercised this gift, this perfect answer that God had given. A man named Stephen in the New Testament. Great example. Acts chapter 6. We, I gave his example in the kind of the ongoing wisdom but as far as this perfect power, perfect understanding, it says in Acts 6, 8, Stephen was full of faith and power and did great wonders and signs among the people. And there arose some of what was called the synagogue of the freedmen, who were Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. Well, what's that tell you? It wasn't just Stephen. Stephen. It was the Holy Spirit working through him. They, could, they couldn't get past his reasoning. They couldn't get past the explanation. Why? Because it was the Holy Spirit interpreting what the Holy Spirit had said in the Old Testament. And it was right. It was perfect. It was good. Another place, really, I would say that we see his perfect answer is after they had a hard time with that, they accused him of blasphemy and they were ready to stone him. But before they actually did that, we have Acts chapter 7. Great chapter in the, book, in, the, in the New Testament. It kind of summarizes the history of Israel in a very condensed space. If you have not read through the Old Testament, first of all, I encourage you to do so. But just as a real good preview and a warm-up, read Acts chapter 7. He re recounts the history of Israel. And when he gets to the part about they resist the Holy Spirit, they didn't like it, and they picked up stones and throwing them at him. When, when he was convicting them of their uh, hypocrisy, if you will. Another place that we see this perfect answer, if you will, 
In the beginning, we read the book of Acts in the beginning in chapter 1, the church is Jewish because it came from Judaism. They were Jews who had not only the message of God, they were God's people. So they were hungry for God to an extent. So those that were there seeking God, God poured out his spirit, the church was born. But, as Pastor Jason brought up not too long ago, the church became Gentile more and more. As the church got reaching to Gentiles, there were some Jews that said, oh, wait a minute. The Gentiles can't really be saved. They have to be Jews first. They've got to be circumcised. They've got to do all of these things. And so great uproar happened, if you will, in the body of Christ. And so this dispute arose, and so they decided, okay, this church in Antioch, we're going to send a delegation down to Israel, and we're going to Jerusalem, and we're going to discuss this. And I believe God used this gifting in James, Jesus' brother, before he was put to death for his faith, the first martyr, beside, well, Stephen, I guess, would have been the first, but James here is in Acts chapter 15, was considered the head of the church in Jerusalem. He was the one that they looked to, and God gave him this gift. They came up with an understanding of, okay, this is what must take place. He says, therefore, I judge that we should no, no longer trouble from among the Gentiles those who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. For Moses has throughout many generations those who preach him in every city, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. And then it pleased the apostles, the elders, with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. It was, it was a pleasing answer. It satisfied both sides. It brought peace, if you will, to the church because, yes, God has indeed confirmed, and I praise God, Gentiles can be true believers. Isn't that, isn't that an amazing thing? That even though we're grafted in, we're still part of the vine, if you will. God has graciously brought us in to the vine. It was this gifting that God used that brought about that unity. There were, there were disputes, there were things that were going on, but in the end, God settled it, and I believed he used this gifting in that process. So, one final place in that aspect of the gift, if you will, in a, in a perfect answer, again, would be Paul's defense. Paul's defense when he's arrested is several chapters long in the book of Acts, so we're not going to read through it. But if you want to, later on at the end of the book of Acts, much of the last several chapters is Paul's defense before a few different leaders. And Paul giving a perfect answer of why he believes what he does believe, and it confounds those that he's speaking to. Now, some would also consider the word of wisdom to have a third aspect to it, and that would be revealing mysteries of God that have to do with his divine purpose, unfolding his plans, uh, future things concerning his people, places, communities, and events. We normally would call that prophecy, future events. Okay. Some say, well, prophecy really, when somebody speaks forth that future event, it's a word of knowledge. Okay, may maybe that's true. We're going to talk more about the future events, though, because to me it's kind of more semantics than it is an important doctrinal division of what we call which one, uh, God does speak in a future sense very clearly. We'll talk more about that in the gifting of prophecy, but some where that really took place in the Old Testament. Remember, the Holy Spirit was not poured out until the New Testament, until the day of Pentecost, but he did pour out his spirit upon prophets. There were people in the Old Testament that certainly that was an important thing. One of the earliest examples is Noah. What did God tell Noah was going to happen? It's going to flood, right? How, how soon did he tell Noah that was going to happen? Long, like 100 plus years? Long time. Sure, Noah. Sure, it's going to. He faithfully preached that message day in, day out. And did God follow through on what was going to happen? Did it flood? Yeah, absolutely. And God preserved Noah and his family and, and the animals because he was obedient. Other things, uh, other examples when there's this future telling, and again, we'll go back more in depth into this, but when Paul was converted on the road to Damascus, 
God chose somebody named Ananias, not the Ananias and Sapphira, a different one. But he reached out to Paul. It's in Acts chapter 9, and he says, I want you to go pray for Paul. And as you do, he's going to receive the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to show him how many things he must suffer. God used Ananias in that process, and he shared with Paul. Paul himself, many different times. In Acts chapter 9, that part in Antioch, it says, I'm going to show him, well, sometime along the, on the road in Paul's life, it doesn't say specifically where he showed him, except for in Acts chapter 23, Jesus tells Paul, be of good cheer, so you must bear witness at Rome. He tells Paul, hey, you're going to go to Rome. Paul had a heart to go to Rome, and Jesus said, you're, you're going. By the Spirit, he gave him that understanding and that knowledge. So it's important because God does want to speak to us through his word, that there is a correct discernment, a correct understanding, and a powerful confounding, if you will, of his wisdom, because we need his wisdom. When Pastor Jason's up here, when I'm up here, no matter who's up here, you don't need our wisdom. We need God's wisdom. We need to hear his heart and his mind. And so this gifting of the word of wisdom has to do with the revelation of that part and and wisely bringing that forth. If we will, the cousin then to that gap gifting is word of knowledge. Okay, so we have in there in verse 8, For one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. Now again, there's a little bit of discussion on what exactly differentiates the two between knowledge and wisdom. I would say this really is the supernatural revelation by the Holy Spirit or past of present things that couldn't otherwise be known. If we will, God's revealing things that the person he reveals them to would have no way of knowing. Okay, not that they're unknowable, but to that person, there's no way that that could have been known, except for God revealed that to them. Let me give you a couple of examples of this. Some people noticed this blind man. In fact, <laughs> it was Jesus' own followers, said, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? What did Jesus say? Neither one. It was neither him or his parents, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Now, how did Jesus know that? Well, he's God, but he set aside his godhood, if you will, these giftings through the Holy Spirit. God revealed this to him that he was born blind. But why? Not because of any sin, because that was the misconception. If you're sin, if you're sick, you know what? That still goes on in the church today. There's a certain segment of the church that says, well, if you're sick, it's your fault. You don't have enough faith, or if this is going on. That's really, it is not a biblical outlook. But that was a common understanding or misunderstanding in the Jews in that day, and that if there was any kind of sickness, it automatically had to do with there's some, some sin or something wrong. You, you've somehow done something against God. And so Jesus said, neither one. Another instance that we know very well, in Mark chapter 12, they're there and they're watching people give money into the treasury. And people are giving great amount of money, sounding trumpets. Look at what I'm giving, look at what I'm giving. And this widow comes by and gives two mites. Now, Jesus knew, he says, hey, I I want you to kind of pay attention. Look at what she gave. She gave everything that she had. Now, how did Jesus know that? Was he following her? Did he have her bank slip? Was it just deduction that obviously, I mean, maybe you could make a blanket statement and say, you know, probably, but he knew that was all that she had. He knew that was of great faith. So who gave more, her or the other one? Okay. That was the gifting of the word of knowledge. It was a certain understanding. It was, without a doubt, true. Now, let's talk about the other Ananias, because you know that Ananias as well, and his wife. At the beginning in the book of Acts is the best example you can of a unity in the church of God. We have great unity in the body This man named Barnabas is brought up, and he sells all of his property and comes for the benefit of the whole body. 
And Ananias and Sapphira said, hey, I like the attention he's getting. That's pretty cool. Let's sell something too, but we're going to say we really sold it for, you know, a million dollar or whatever, you know. They're, they're trying to deceive and say, I gave all the money that it, from this sale to, but they held back money. But they said, yes, this is what I gave. They were given opportunity. So they came and Ananias comes before, he says, yes, that, this is what I did. And what did Peter say? <laughs> you lied to the Holy Spirit. You, you're not just lying to me, you lied to the Holy Spirit. What happened to Ananias? <laughs> and then his wife comes in later. Uh, apparently not knowing what had happened, because I would hope if she did, she would, you know, obviously she didn't know what had happened because she comes in later and she tells the same story. Conspiracy right there, right? They agreed ahead of time. This is what we're going to say. He gave her an opportunity. Is this indeed what you sold it for? Nope. Or, or yes, it is. And then he said, no. They, the people that carried out your husband are going to carry you out, and boom, she's dead. That's this gifting here of, of word of knowledge. How did Peter know that? Was he, again, was he there at the transaction? Was he there at the city gate or the bank? Or did he know the owner of the property? No. But God revealed that through his Holy Spirit because it was important to understand. As a result of Ananias and Sapphira, God wiping them out on the spot, do you think there were others in the body of Christ that were pretty quick to, to try and lie to the Holy Spirit? It had a very purifying effect, didn't it? You know, it, it says that they grew, you know, they were growing in love, but also in fear of the Lord because God used these gifts in, in a purifying way as well, bringing glory to him. But it is important that sometimes, it, given certain situations, that there needs to be keen insight that's impossible for us to know. I've been present several times when this kind of gifting is used in prayer services, afterglows, those kinds of things, where maybe there's specifically somebody that really needs prayer. But that person either is shy or you know, doesn't feel it's important to bring it up, but it's revealed that something's going on. A certain situations, whether it's a physical situation, whether it's a family situation, that somebody that knew absolutely nothing at all what was going on now suddenly had understanding, maybe not even knew who the person was, but as that's brought up, the person says, that's, that's me. Would you pray for me? And that's powerful because when that happens, we understand that not only does God care to speak to us as a whole through his word, and we're not adding to his word, please understand me. We do not add to his word, but there are specific things that God wants to speak to us, to our heart, to our situation, specifically because God knows us intimately. God knows us better than we know ourselves. And he does desire to do work. He does desire to heal. He does desire to bring reconciliation, whatever that situation may be. Or in a situation like Ananias and Sapphira, he wants to stop the deception. He wants to stop the, the sin that's going on and, and purify the body of Christ. This gifting plays a big part in that. Other places in the New Testament where we see this, this happening, uh, Peter and Ananias and Sapphira, we have Old Testament examples. Of course, the prophets, quite often, not only would a prophet tell future events, but current events. There's an interesting passage in 2 Kings chapter 6 where Elisha, the prophet, there's a king of Syria coming in and trying to fight against Israel. And every move that the king of Syria makes, Elisha tells the people from Israel, now this is what I want you to do, go here and here. So much so that the king of Syria thinks it's an inside job. He thinks he has a traitor on his hand. He says, Ring, I, I want to know who's doing this. He said, king, it's, it's, it's not us. But Elisha, the prophet of Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. Well, how would he know that? Because the Holy Spirit revealed to Elijah, this is what's going on. And God used that to preserve the nation of Israel. So he will do it to preserve us, to speak to us directly, when that kind of information is needed. Again, the giftings that God gives, for the most part, are for a situation, for need. This gift is poured out, but that doesn't mean that somebody that has this gifting at the drop of the hat is going to know everything in your life. Thankfully, 
That would be a little weird, wouldn't it? That doesn't mean somebody that has this gift is omniscient like God is. There's only one omniscient one, and that's God. And through his Holy Spirit, he gives this gift specific times for specific reasons to reveal something that needs to be revealed for the benefit of all. Okay, so the third gifting that I want to talk to you about that would be considered a revelation gift is discerning of spirits. That doesn't follow exact in order, but if you look at the order of what Paul has here, it's not a complete listing of every gifting. The topic really has to do, the overall context has to do, there's lots of gifts, diversities of gifts. There's individual gifts given. By the way, it says God chooses who gets what. If you look at the end of that passage, we don't. God chooses. We are told to pray in, in chapter 14, but God is the one who chooses in his wisdom. So it's not necessarily imperative that we follow exact order that we get the overall understanding is where I'm going with that. So just so that we can group them together and talk about them and being revelation gift things that could not be known to man. Okay? In, that, in that sense, he's revealing to us things that could not be known. The other one that would fit into that category would be discerning of spirits. So it says in verse 10, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the discerning of spirits. Now, I've had some brothers and sisters in Christ, well-meaning, says, God gave me this spiritual gift of discernment. Okay, well, I do believe God gives discernment, but this does not say discernment. It says discerning of spirits. It's different. Okay. What is discerning of spirits? It's a revelation from God to know the motivation or the power behind an action, a thought, or a future action, something that's going to take place. Who's the power behind this, in essence? It's, a, it's a, an unveiling of the spiritual realm. Now, are there, are, oh, this is kind of a weird question. Are there angels around us? Yes. Is this a spiritual realm? Yes. There's even interesting things that Paul brings out. Hey, be careful that you cover your head because the angels are watching. It's like, do, but do we see the angels? No. Okay. Does that mean that because we don't see them, there's no spiritual realm? Of course not. We know that there is. In this gifting, if you will, spiritually, the blinders are taken off, and there's a perfect understanding where this is coming from. Is this coming from God, or is this coming from Satan? Because there's really no in-between. It's either from God, or it's from Satan. And there are some things that can look really flowery, that sound really godlike, that are definitely not from God. As a matter of fact, if you take what most of the cults say, there's a lot of scripture in there. It could sound really good. They might even use the same Bible or maybe just t- change it a little bit or add future references to it. There's a need to understand because if, if we don't understand, hey, this is not from God, it sounds pretty good, then deception can take place, can it? Because those that follow Satan can masquerade as angels of light. They can look good. But that doesn't make them an angel of light. Examples where this takes place. Again, Acts chapter 8. One of the best places to look, if you will, in operations of these gifts is the book of Acts. There are many other places, but Peter dealt with a couple of sorcerers come up in the book of Acts. This one's named Simon. In Acts chapter 8, Simon the sorcerer saw the giftings of the Holy Spirit being poured out as they laid hands on, on others. So, and when they did, the Holy Spirit was poured out, this baptism of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and Simon said, wow, I want, a, I, I want that gift too. Let, let, me, let me buy that gift, essentially. And Peter said to Simon the sorcerer, your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of your wickedness, and pray that if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Now, I believe this went past the personal observation. I think this was an insight from the Holy Spirit on exactly what was happening and the motivation behind it. If the giftings were something that we could buy... Who would have the most giftings? Rich people, right? Rich people would walk around with lots of gifts. 
God in his wisdom say, who's really rich in spiritual things? Is it the wealthy or the poor? What did Jesus say? It's the poor, and, and that's God's way. They, they try this, and this goes back a long time. Maybe you can buy your way out of something, by condola, by, uh, what do you call that? Buy your way out of sin. What's the word I'm looking for? Indulgences, thank you. You can buy indulgences and you know, buy your way out. Well, that's not biblical either, is it? So where does this idea come from? Well, obviously he knew that was from Satan. There's another sorcerer brought up. This time Paul is dealing with this one, named Elymas, in Acts chapter 13. It says, when they had gone to the island of Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus. Hey, sounds a lot like Jesus, right? Who was the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man? This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas the sorcerer, for his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. And then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, O full of deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, you will not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord. And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you should be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. Paul knew exactly where these things were. He, he might have been able to masquerade and sound like things, you know, this great power was from God. You go today, you know, psychics, where do I have this gift? I have this psychic gift. Oh, it comes from God. Hmm. I think there's some things in the scripture that might counter contradict that, because we're forbidden witchcraft and soothsaying, and so. But if you're a soothsayer that that comes from God, it's like, well, no. You don't even necessarily need the gift of discerning the spirits to know that one, because God told us that very plainly, didn't He? But there can be people that are raised up even within the church that say, "Thus says the Lord," blah blah blah. It sounds good. And maybe, maybe it's possible, but then this gifting comes and say, wait, 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 hold on. That's not from the Lord. And maybe it's a scripture, or maybe it's specifically something else in this gifting that they know this exactly is not from God. Don't listen to that. There's another interesting one in Acts chapter 16. They're in prayer, and there's a servant, uh, a, a servant girl or a slave girl who is possessed by a spirit of divination. And as Paul's trying to teach and speak to them, this girl followed him around. And she cry, kept crying out, These men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. Sounds good, right? Hey, that must be God. <laughs> and and she, it says she did this for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. Now, it sounds like it was coming from the Lord, but obviously... God's not going, to inter not going to interrupt himself, is he? And God had given Paul many giftings, I believe, and discerning of spirits was also involved in here, knowing that, no, this is not from God. This is from the enemy. He wants to distract. He wants to take away. Even the demons, when Jesus was casting them out, knew who Jesus was, right? So just an acknowledgement that something is biblical or scriptural doesn't necessarily mean the, the motive or the... The person behind that is, you know, Satan would love to destroy from within. And if we're not careful, if we don't follow the truth of scriptures, and if we don't listen to what he really says, deception can happen. I've mentioned it before, but majority of the people that begin in cults came from a church background. They grew up possibly reading the Bible, but because they didn't pay attention, because Possibly some of these gifts were not in operation. They didn't have a strong, solid foundation. They were deceived. So that was another example. In the Old Testament, Jeremiah is a good example. Um, <laughs> Jeremiah, if you will, was the, was the lone prophet left that was telling the truth. Jeremiah is called the weeping prophet because he had a message nobody wanted to listen to. His message was, repent, God's going to destroy. You're going to go to Babylon and, because you're not following. But there were false prophets, one of them being, being this prophet Hananiah. And he would go around 
trying to tell the kings, no, don't listen to Jeremiah, he's false, he's false. And so there was this going back and forth, and Jeremiah says, Hear now, Hananiah, the Lord has not sent you, but you make this people trust in a lie. Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I will cast you from the face of the earth. This year you shall die because you have taught rebellion against the Lord. So Hananiah the prophet died the same year in the seventh month. Jeremiah said, no, certainly that's not from the Lord. It might sound encouraging. Just because it's an encouraging message doesn't necessarily mean it's from the Lord. Jeremiah's message was from the Lord because they needed to repent. Because they had gotten into idolatry, they had gotten away from the Lord, but they wouldn't listen. If Hananiah was allowed to continue on, this false voice would just go on and on and on. So God dealt with it, and he destroyed it. Now, these giftings that we talked about, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, the discerning of spirits, are they still for today? They absolutely are. You know, I, I, I don't quite understanding all of the mentality of what a cessationalist, and that's somebody who believes the gifts have ceased, for a couple of reasons, because God still desires to do the same things in the body now that he did then. And the giftings that we have, we know in part, they won't cease until we're with the Lord, if you will. When we're with the Lord, is there a need for spiritual gifts? No. Why? Because we'll, we won't know in part anymore. It'll all be revealed to us. But until then, there are things that are mysterious. There are things that are hidden to us that sometimes, sometimes, we need to know or it's beneficial to know. And God will bring those out. So does God speak to his people today? Yes, he does. Now, as I mentioned, we talked at the beginning of, or the last song that we did before we began the message today is, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. I'm firmly convinced that God wants to do a great work in this body and involve all of the giftings that we're going to talk about. Of course, they have to be exercised decently in an order, as he brings up in chapter 14. Uh, But God does desire to do a deep work in the body and individually in each one of us. When these gifts are exercised as the Holy Spirit intends, It brings us into a deeper appreciation for who God is and that the knowledge that he wants to speak to us personally and corporately causes us to fall more in love with him because we see how much he cares. Would you stand with me, please? My prayer is that you will stay open to what God might want to do. Because if you're really willing to say, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here, that means the Holy Spirit is welcome to do things according to his will, according to what he knows are the necessary things that need to take place. That can make us a little uncomfortable because it gets out of a realm where we totally, we can say the Holy Spirit's in this box and he has to work this way. He doesn't work that way. He's very creative in what he wants to do. But we need to remain open for what God would do in this body and in us personally. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you loved us, that you gave Jesus to die for us, and that you still, Lord, speak to us, not only through his blood, but through your Holy Spirit, that you've poured out blessings and giftings that you desire for us to exercise, Lord, not just for our benefit, but to strengthen the body, that we might know you deeper and fall more in love with you, God. And so we do pray, Lord, for a fresh outpouring of your Holy Spirit, that, Lord, you would baptize us in your spirit, that there would be nothing held back, Lord, that you desire to do in us and that you desire to do in this body, God. We give you all glory, honor, and praise for who you are and what you do. In Jesus' name, amen.